Okay, everyone, thank you for your patience today. I'm Stephanie Gaspar and welcome to our program this evening. I'm on the board of Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society and appreciate everyone watching. This is our last program of the season, so be sure to join us in September when we resume. I want to give a special thanks to everyone that has come to our field trips and supports our chapter in various ways. We are planning to have in-person meetings again next season, so stay tuned for details. Stay up to date on chapter activities through Facebook and our website. If you are not on our mailing list, please reach out so we can add you. If you haven't seen any of our previous programs before, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. For today's program, log into YouTube and type any questions you have in the chat. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If we have any connection problems, please be assured that we will be working on fixing it as soon as possible. I'm pleased to introduce tonight's guest, Dustin Angel. He is Archbold Biological Station's Director of Education and will present an overview of Archbold's research, conservation, and education projects. Archbold is a nonprofit field station in the headwaters of the Florida Everglades with the mission to build and share the scientific knowledge needed to protect the life, lands, and waters of the heart of Florida and beyond. Today, you will learn about Archbold's conservation initiatives as a part of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, Corridor as well. Dustin is an environmental educator and conservation photographer living and working in the headwaters of Florida's Everglades. As a director of education at Archbold Biological Station in Venus, Florida, he builds community relationships and interprets ecological research for audiences of all ages. Dustin holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from Alfred University. His photography, which highlights science and environmental stewardship, has been published nationally in Living Bird and Birding Magazines. A recent collaboration with the Wild Center in New York State resulted in a permanent climate change solutions exhibit. Dustin is the two-time former president of the League of Environmental Educators in Florida and a recipient of the Outstanding Educator Award from the Florida chapter of the Wildlife Society. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Dustin. I will now pass it over to you. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that you're all here with us. I'm excited to talk about Archbold Biological Station. I, I live in Sebring, Florida, which is about an hour and 45 minutes south of Orlando. And then Archbold is another half an hour south of me. We're in the middle of the state and I'll show you a map in a, in a minute. Uh, so let's see if our slides are working here. There we go, there I am in my day-to-day -day job as an education, as an environmental educator at Archbold Biological Station doing summer camps and virtual field trips and YouTube videos and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And sometimes what I do is out in the field. Sometimes what I do is sitting here at my desk um, giving presentations like this. But hopefully in the future, I can come and visit you all in person and do uh, and do this uh, another presentation, but we can all meet each other. What I was thinking today is I would give a real brief overview at the beginning about what is Archbold, uh, what do we do there, what are our main focus areas, and spend some time on the Florida Wildlife Corridor, because this is such a big, important um, piece of legislation and plan for the state of Florida, and Archbold is a big part of this. And then... Birds, birds, birds. I'll, I'll, I'll dive into the three bird species that Archbold has been studying for decades. The Florida scrub jay, the Florida grasshopper sparrow, and the red cockaded woodpecker. I love this map here. You can see that Archbold is a field station, which means it's a place-based research site. Field stations, most of them, in the US are run by universities, but Archbold's an independent nonprofit. And we have grown and grown and grown from our roots 80 plus years ago, from a, a small field station to really a whole organization, a whole research conservation 
and education organization. And this map, you can see the headwaters of the Everglades. That's the lands and waters that drain south into Lake Okeechobee. And Lake Okeechobee is the liquid heart of the Everglades. On this map, you'll see lots of orange uh, marks on there. Those are all different field sites where Archbold staff work. We have about 55 staff people. So even though our actual properties are down on the south end of this, the, the big blobs down there, uh, they work throughout this whole region. We have four pillars, pillars of science and conservation. Everything that we do, whether it's related to birds or plants or soil, air, whatever it is, relates to these four pillars. Saving the rarest of the rare, connecting landscapes and wildlife corridors, sustaining grasslands, ranches, and working lands, and addressing climate change. Here's just a few pictures of some of the researchers that work at Archbold. And I couldn't start a talk without zooming out first and thinking about our, our fragile blue planet and our wonderful state of Florida. If you look at this picture, you can actually see the big Lake Okeechobee there. And if you go up from that, you'll see an area that's kind of gray, that's Orlando. So that whole section in the middle, that's the headwaters area. And just on the side, on the kind of right in the middle of the state is the strip running down, gray strip. That's the Lake Wales Ridge. It's a big sandy island. And Archbold Biological Station, our property is down on the southern end of that. This, this state hasn't changed in size in the last 100 years or so. Uh, if you went back 20,000 years ago, that would be a different story during the Ice Age. But since, um, since 1900, same size, but take a look at how many people have come to Florida. We currently have 1,000 people or more coming to Florida every day, every day. So we're in increasing our population a lot. And what does that mean for the wildlife and the, and the water and the air? Um, it means that we need to have a plan. <laughs> and I wanted to start with this because uh, that's what the Florida Wildlife Corridor is. It's, it, it's a plan that's based on science. It's based on what the animals need. Um, they can't, you can't just have a park down at the, you know, national park at the bottom of the state and another one someplace else. They need connected areas. We have this video we just made. That's me before I cut my hair two months ago. And this hasn't been released yet on YouTube. So that you're seeing the sneak peek draft version. It's six minutes long. And it looks at the science that Archbold is doing related to the corridor. There are other partners doing other things too. But I want to emphasize what it is that Archbold's doing. So we'll see some interviews with some of our researchers. Have you ever visited a natural area in Florida and found some animal tracks on the ground? Maybe you wondered what animal it was and if it lived there the whole year or if it was just passing through. For example, here at Archbold in the Florida scrub habitat, we have a lot of bear activity in the fall when the bears can eat acorns and salt palmetto berries and hickory nuts, but not much bear activity the rest of the year. How much room do bears and panthers need to roam and which part of the state do they use how can science help us figure this out and how can we make sure to protect those areas so these animals can live into the future plus where does archbold fit into all of this well let's start with the corridor observatory the corridor observatory is a network of wildlife cameras and audio recorders that we're using to monitor wildlife communities within the Florida Wildlife Corridor. The Florida Wildlife Corridor is a network of more or less ecologically connected nature reserves like state parks, national parks, national wildlife management areas, wildlife, uh, state wildlife management areas, etc. 
as well as working private lands that support the corridor. So we're using this network of devices to monitor how animals are moving across these boundaries and, and using this kind of whole geography that we now um, come to know. Every month, our crew from Archbold and our collaborators at the University of Florida go to the field to service the devices and make sure they keep working. So that means changing out the batteries, swapping out the SD cards that contain all of our data. That means doing some site maintenance with weed trimmers um, just to make sure that the weeds and uh, grass don't grow up and interfere with the collection of data. And crucially, making sure that the seals and everything are free of fouling like dust and sand and, and particles of grass and things like that. So there's quite a lot of work. It's fairly labor intensive to keep these sensitive electronic devices running in the field, which is pretty hostile here in Florida. The Corridor Observatory launched in 2022. It's a new and growing project, but has already recorded bear, panther, deer, hogs, birds, and more at Archbold and nearby properties. The observatory also offers a glimpse into animal behavior and interactions, like raccoons fighting a bobcat. The Corridor Observatory and other research show that the Florida Wildlife Corridor is vital for wildlife in our state. But without a map and a plan, the future of these animals is in doubt. Science and art of map making is also known as cartography. And we use cartography for a lot of different things here at Archbold. This is an example of a project that we did in 2009 and 2010, where we followed the journey of a Florida black bear. He had a GPS collar around his neck and we could download that data and see where he traversed the landscape. This bear started down in the Archbold area and headed up towards Orlando and back down in a short period of time. Uh, and this bear also became the inspiration for the Florida Wildlife Corridor because while he traversed some lands that were conserved, there are plenty of other areas on his pathway that are not yet protected and could be lost to development if we don't act soon. Here we have a map of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, and this is based on the University of Florida's Ecological Greenways Network. Um, and everything that is in green here is the Florida Wildlife Corridor. The darker green areas are areas that are already conserved, and the lighter green areas are what we call opportunity areas, which are areas that are yet to be conserved. Here's another example of how we use maps. This is a map of land cover in the Florida Wildlife Corridor. You can see in the southern part of the state, there's a lot of agriculture here, and it's specifically ranch lands. And in the northern part of the state, there's a lot more forested areas. Both of these habitats are really supportive of wildlife movement, which is why they are in the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Florida's population is growing by over 1,100 people per day for the last 18 months. That's equivalent to adding almost a Miami's worth of people every single year. That's a pretty frightening pace, so we have to find a place to put all those people. The Florida Wildlife Corridor provides a plan or a blueprint for how to do that. The areas that might be better for development and the areas where we should be avoiding it to protect areas for wildlife and for nature. At Archbold, we do the science that helps inform how to turn that Florida Wildlife Corridor uh, vision into conservation on the ground. That includes, for instance, prioritizing the areas that are most important to conserve first either because they're the most important for biodiversity or because they're at the highest risk of development or some combination of the two. Even though Florida's population is growing really fast, we're actually in a pretty fortunate position conservation-wise. Florida leads the way in states east of the Mississippi in land conservation, and we have over 30% of the state already conserved. That's thanks to the decades-long effort of lots of corridor conservation partners who were doing corridor conservation long before we called it that. There's still a lot to learn and more work to be done, but Archbold and our partners will continue to build the science and support the protection of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. 
Thanks for watching. All right. Uh, so there you go. Sneak peek of the new Archbold YouTube video. Before I move on to the bird work, I, I want to mention military lands here for two reasons. One is when you think about the corridor, you might be thinking about nature preserves. But if, if you're a bear or a panther, a state park or a national park is for you is the same as a cattle ranch or a military air force range. And uh, all three of the birds I'm gonna focus on today all, all live at the Avon Park Air Force Range. Uh, two of them also live, or one of them also lives at Archbold's main property too. But Department of Defense land has much more conservation value than most people realize. They have more imperiled species than the national parks do despite having less than half the land. And then this little this little graph here is super cool. You can see um, when it comes to uh, um, concentration of rare species, the Department of Defense has way more um, imperiled species than the other federal lands do. When I first saw that, it kind of blew my mind. I want to give a shout out to visiting researchers. We have our, our long-term projects and some of them have been going on for over 50 years, like with the Florida Scrub Jay, but we also have graduate students and other visiting researchers that, that come to the station. So Ellie Knight here, she's working on uh, Nighthawks in that photo. This was a few years ago. She was capturing Nighthawks and putting GPS backpacks on them really cool and this is a new project that Karina's working on at Archbold with grackles where she's it's an, it's an urban bird and she's catching grackles and then um, having them do memory tests and, and things like that with them because they're incredibly smart. Joan Morrison's been working with Archbold for uh, over 30 years and she specializes on crested caracara and here she is hiding in a little a little blind that she made as she's trying to uh, observe some caracaras and and catch one so she can put on uh, a tracking um, a little tracking backpack on it now the big three the florida scrub jay we'll start with this one and since you're an audubon group i am guessing that most of you have seen a florida scrub jay they're they're actually in a lot of different parts of Florida, though their numbers have been decreasing quite a bit, something like 90% or more uh, in the last 100 years or so. So they are around, but there's many fewer of them than there used to be. They are um, a federally threatened species. There's currently less than a thousand uh, Florida scrub jays out there. It's a bird that's only found in Florida and you find it on the high and dry sandy spots. In these photos, I like to put the, these up, especially when I have a live crowd and say like, what's happening? What's going on in these pictures? You can on the YouTube add comments on there too and, and put like, what, what are they doing with their phones up like that? Well, this is Reed and Fitz and they've both been studying uh, Florida scrub jays for I don't know how long, more than 30 years. Um, and both, I think they both came to Archbold as students originally and ended up uh, both being directors of the uh, Avian Ecology Program. So that's pretty cool. Well, Reed is director of the Avian Ecology Program and Fitz was actually the executive director of Archbold. And I love this picture uh, of him. That's not Photoshopped on there. That is a scrub jay landing on his head. Maybe some of you have even had a scrub jay land on your head. These are incredibly smart. They have amazing memories. When I take people out into the scrub, I like to ha have them imagine that they're in a time machine. And going, going back in time a million years ago, maybe three million years ago, a period when the ocean was higher than today and most of Florida was underwater you have these sand dunes up above the water with scrub habitat on them. The sand is uh, you know, pretty infertile, almost no nutrients. It's hot. It's 
a drought half of the year, and then it's thunderstorms and lightnings the other half of the year, sometimes hurricanes as well. And the, and the lightning brings fire. It's a very difficult place to live, but Florida scrub jays, they adapted. They're, I think of them as the masters of the Florida scrub because they found, they found ways to adapt primarily by living in really tight family groups, being cooperative breeders. But it means that the fate of the scrub jay is tied to the fate of the habitat. As scrub is lost, and right now there's only about 15% of the, of the Florida scrub left, um, as it goes away, so too does the species because, because they're a specialist on this habitat. It's not like a blue jay that can live pretty well in, in urban areas. These, these are um, indicators of the health of that habitat because that's the only place you're going to find them. If there's some uh, a citrus grove or something next to scrub, or houses next to scrub. Yes, you can see scrub jays in a citrus grove for sure, but that's not where they're living. They're gonna be living in the scrub next to it. I mentioned lightning and fires and that the scrub jays have to live in this difficult situation, but actually most of Florida, almost all of Florida burns. And Florida is the lightning strike capital of North America. So we shouldn't be surprised. When researchers look back at fossil records, what they see is that forever, as long as as long as Florida has been above sea level um, for millions of years, they see plants that today are related today to plants that we know are um, in fire adapted ecosystems. But then the question is, how much fire? How often should you have a fire? because today we can't wait for lightning to start it. We have roads, ditches, houses. We know fire is important, that the plant communities and the animal communities need it, but how often? Every habitat is different, but I love this graph here. This shows a number of scrub jay territories, that means families, number of scrub jay families in, this one, in one area, and the time since fire. We see, this really strong relationship here that um, you, you have a fire here, like we did a fire in 1990. Before that, the scrub jay families were dropping down. We had five families and then they started less and less families in this plot of land. I think this was about a hundred acres in this plot of land here. We did a prescribed fire and boom, look at that. Over the next 10 years, the families of scrub jays in that plot of land just went way up. There's this sweet spot around 10 years where you have the most. And then after that, they're dropping off again. You get 20 years since a fire in the scrub and the Florida scrub jays are pretty much gone from that area. Just because you see a, an area of scrub that didn't get bulldozed and turned into houses, just because you see green there, doesn't mean that it's in good condition. And the scrub jays are an indicator for us of actually how that how well that scrub is doing. So at Archbold, we try to burn around every, every 10 years for the scrub habitat. If it's a different kind of habitat, like in this picture here, that, that's a, a field, that's an agricultural spot, um, every one, two, maybe three years for something like that. Florida grasshopper sparrows who live uh, in the Florida dry prairie and an area that burns very frequently, again, every one to three years. This is a very rare species, critically endangered. It's, it's a subspecies. There's another uh, Florida grasshopper sparrow and they even share territory during part of the year, but then the other one moves up north for the breeding season. Currently in the wild, there's a, something like 275 individuals. This is on uh, five properties that the state is aware of and monitors. There might be some other ones out there too, like um, maybe on some private cattle ranches and, and the, we just don't know. Um, but Archbold and other partners are monitoring birds. Archbold's monitoring them at two sites and it's been a whole journey. Actually, seeing the number 275 
is actually kind of amazing. If I had done this talk in 2018, there were less than 50, um, uh, less than 50 males that were um, recorded that year. And now we have something like 175 males that we're recording. So that's huge. And I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why the number is increasing, because this is a bird that was very close to going extinct just a few years ago. It's not out of the woods, but it is doing better. Um, and this is the only part of the world where you find them in, the, in this on this map right here. They used to have a little bit of a bigger distribution than that. But the Florida, um, the dry prairie in Florida is uh, pretty much non-existent these days. I'm not going to show this whole video, but this is an interview um, that I shot of Becky Windsor, who was working on Florida grasshopper sparrows at the time. The video, she goes into how she fights fire ants. I'm not going to show that part. I just want to show you the part where she talks about field work. Because sometimes people will say, I want to see one of these birds. How do I see them? And they say, okay, it's really hard. And you're probably not going to see one unless you go out with a biologist. Uh, so she, in, the, in this video, she's not talking about time of day it is. But they go out, the researchers go out before the sun rises to set up their mist nets and, um, and catch these birds. And, you know, when we survey for the sparrows, um, we will do some point count transects. And so essentially you walk out to a designated GPS point and you li listen in all four directions. You turn your head. You're just trying to hear those, those males singing. And, and the first time you hear one, it's just so exciting. And then the real work begins because then you have to find it. Um, so they're little and they're brown and they're perched on little brown sticks and twigs, you know, a couple feet above the ground, level with all of the vegetation. So we use spotting scopes um, and you just sort of scan the horizon and once you see him, the male singing and oh, it's so exciting. It's like, finally, like you have it. And then you get to watch him for a little bit. And if you're lucky and he's paired, you might get to see his female. The females are very tricky to find as well because they don't sing. So you have to use the male to find the female and then use the female to find the nest. It's a whole process. Okay, I just wanted to show that little that little clip of of Becky. Oh, let's see if this PowerPoint will let me get to the next. On these poor little. There we go. Uh, I love this this photo here of one of the Florida grasshopper sparrow biologists, and I I like pulling this up too when I'm giving a presentation, saying, "What is going on here? Uh, what are these tools? What is she carrying? It looks like she has like a giant octopus in her hand or something. And what, what this is, is she's carrying equipment to build a fence for, um, uh, for the Florida uh, grasshopper sparrows. They nest out in these areas here. It's very, uh, very uh, open. There's no trees. In fact, if there ends up being a tree within even a couple hundred yards of a nest, then the babies are probably going to get eaten by a hawk or something. Um, so they're out in these these big, wide, uh, open prairies, and every nest counts. So they are, uh, the researchers put up a little fence around the nest, and what she's holding is uh, um, upholstery stuffing. So here you can see Natalie actually stuffing the upholstery down in the bottom of the fence. And of course, the, it's only a fence. You have to have it open so the, the mom can fly in and out. But it does work. It, it, it does um, help deter predators from getting in here. What you see in the other photo there is Greg, and he's actually lifting a nest. The nest was there the, naturally, the birds put it there, but there is a storm event coming. And that means that even though this is called the Florida dry prairie, it does get flooded. What he's going to do is raise the nest just a couple inches, just a little bit to give these birds a chance to not get flooded. And you might think, well, if they get flooded, maybe that's just nature, let it happen. But when we have such a critically endangered species like this, really every bird counts and Yes, if you were here a few hundred years ago, some would get flooded. 
it wouldn't it wouldn't matter for the for the whole population but today it does and there's one of these little cutie pies right there i said that the numbers have gone up and that 175 males uh last year was a is a pretty big deal because it was less than 50 just a few a few years back why is it different it's because of captive bred birds um raising captive bred birds is the and introducing them is the last thing that you do and in fact the researchers that that work on this there's a whole big working group they um they debated they argued for years as the as the numbers of those birds were dropping 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 uh, with people saying you know what i think it's time to do it we need to get out there capture some birds and then raise them there there are special places that are kind of like zoos that raise um rare species so they were brought to these places and and um this was oh six years ago maybe when they started doing this and the last few years they've now been introducing these birds so the photo there with the cage uh with, sorry with the enc outdoor enclosure that is where some of them live and they are about to get transferred see what um fabi the researcher in the front there is carrying it's like a little bird hotel just for transport just for transport then they'll bring them to the site which is in the bottom right and they'll give them a night overnight um, in this trailer the trailer you don't see it in this photo but inside the trailer it's all set up with grass it's like a nice little um you know uh diorama kind of thing and they'll put in some some grasshoppers and stuff in there for them to eat but then the next day they'll open the door and let the birds out hopefully they'll have calmed down and not been so stressed and it's working Moving on to red cockaded woodpeckers. If any of you have ever seen a woodpecker, a red cockaded woodpecker, that's awesome because um, they're they're a little easier to see maybe than the Florida grasshopper sparrows, but they're still tough to find. If you're ever in a forest, a longleaf pine forest, or maybe maybe a, a South Florida slash pine forest, you might notice trees with white paint on them. And that means that's a tree where there's a cavity there, where there's a uh, there might be there might be a bird living in there. And if you're real lucky and you're looking around, you might find one. They're called red cockaded, um, but if you look at this picture right here, you might think like, oh, that's not what I thought it would look like. I thought it'd have like a big red thing. The males have just a little bit of red on them, just this little tiny little bit of of red, and that's and that's it. What makes them really special is that, well, they're special for lots of reasons, but one of the things that makes them really special is that they live in live trees, not dead trees. Oh, hold on. Um, oh, and currently in the wild, something like uh, 6,000 clusters. There's, uh, there's more than this, but I couldn't find the most up-to-date number. And a cluster is a family of birds, so that's one to six birds per cluster. Here we go. So you can see you can see these trees, and in the top right, that is a bird. Uh, th those are examples of birds who have naturally made cavities, and that's probably a longleaf pine. And it it can take them on average over six years to do this, which is um, amazing. Uh, picking at it a little bit of the time, and you see this white stuff around the hole. This is what uh, helps protect them from predators like snakes, in particular rat snakes. They, the, the longleaf pines particularly produce a lot of sap and all around the hole is all this sap that makes it difficult for animals to climb in there and, and get, they still do, but makes it difficult for them to get in there. Um, that might be why, one of, well, one of the reasons why they seem to like why they seem to prefer longleaf pines the problem is there's been so much um uh turpentining and then logging of uh longleaf pines that that system that used to be across the whole southeastern us even all the way over into texas is 
almost gone. It's something like 3% of it is left, 3%, 5%, something like that. And you do have spots with, with new growth, but those trees might only be 60 years old or something like that. Um, so that's what we're seeing in this, in this picture here is trees that are old enough to be trees that would that that are um, that that one of these birds might look at and go, oh, that looks kind of nice, but it takes six years. So what the researchers do is they climb up there and get a chainsaw, make a hole, and they stick a birdhouse in there. They stick an artificial cavity inside there. They, and then they uh, put goop around it, paint it, try to make it look as natural as they can. When the birds are picking trees, they want trees that are close to 100 years old or older because those ones have um, a rot on the inside. So their wood is a little softer. Even with that, it still takes them years. So it's very tough for them to do this on their own. It takes a long time. But having researchers do this works. And the numbers of these birds have been returning and they actually are just, it hasn't gone into effect yet, but it's its happening. They've been downlisted from endangered to threatened. And that's because of all of the hard work of field biologists and land managers who are who are burning these areas. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I want to say about that. So questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here because I can't see um, I can't see anything when I'm sharing so and I also have a special guest for us someone who was in some of those photos that I was sharing is my wife Emily who's a biologist at Archbold and so I said would you hop on the Q&A so I'll turn the blur off on here and she'll sit here with me Great job, Dustin, and nice to meet you too, Emily. Thanks Hi. for joining us. Yes, no problem. Excellent. There is a little bit, yes, of the blur. Hang on. He's, I'll, I'll he's try working to, on it. You just keep going and hopefully okay. I'll get it figured out. Sure. So awesome job, interesting information, and I have lots of questions. So the first, I have a few comments. I really liked the video that you shared in the beginning where you showed a preview of the wildlife corridor and just what it takes for researchers to manage instruments in the field. So I do have a question about that. Perhaps you or Emily could answer. Uh, how many of these uh, devices do you think uh, are, are out in the field per season? Like across all the sites, do you think there's hundreds uh, where you have to change the battery and the upkeep? Well, this is what she actually does. This is her day-to-day -day <laughs> job. So yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't speak for all the biologists and all the projects out there, but our project in the Predator Prey Lab, um, we have these devices, game cameras and acoustic monitors across three different sites. And there's about 44 individual sites or you know spots at each of these three sites so we're talking about you know 150 ish um cameras and ARUs so double that and it's it's a lot you know you've got the Florida heat and sun coming down on these things um a lot of these are out in the scrub so you've got the sand that gets into everything you have you know the batteries are always dying as equipment's malfunctioning so it's it's almost a full-time job just keeping this equipment going and one of the biggest issues is the animals they get very curious um especially when it's the time of year when the bears come around with the cubs because they want to come up they want to see what it is i can't tell you how many pictures we have of bears deer raccoon with their with their faces right here like what is that you know you can hear them snuffling and they'll, they'll pull things off, the bears especially. They see the little microphone sticking out there. They will bite it off. And then we can't get data anymore. They'll, they'll pull the antennas off of the cameras. So, yeah, I've actually had to devise some ways to keep them from getting into it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. And I feel that most people may not realize how much work goes behind the scenes just for some of this uh, good data collection. 
Yeah, it's it's never a leave it and forget it kind of deal. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when it, companies build devices, they don't generally have Florida. They're not testing them in Florida. <laughs> Even if they say, oh, it's safe for outdoor use. Well, yeah. Yeah. Florida outdoor With, use? Within reason, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I also had another comment that the video of the raccoons fighting the bobcat, that was crazy. Yeah. And is this a common occurrence? And do you have another story of some uh, unexpected uh, altercation? No, I can answer that. So yeah, that one, I had come across those photos when I was going through our, our pictures and I had to show my boss like, oh my gosh, look at this, this is amazing. And he'd never seen or heard of anything like that. And I'm actually in the process of writing up a short note about it just to publish, just as an interesting field observation, um, because I can't find anything in the literature about a fight like that. Um, but uh, what I have found is news articles talking about raccoons attacking people's pet cats mm -hmm. and killing them. So just be careful with your pet cats outside, but nothing with bobcats. So yeah, it's, it's somewhat unusual, um, but I will mention another interesting, not aggressive behavior, but just the other day I came across these photos of a, of a wild hog full out sleeping, just passed out. And these cows kept coming over and sniffing at him and he was just dead to the world. It was the neatest thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I just always love those wildlife cameras because you really don't know what you're going to capture. So yeah. very cool. Uh, and yeah, fun. you all should put one in your yard. Mm -hmm. They're like 70 bucks, 80 bucks online. Yeah. So mm -hmm. cool. Okay, so a couple of, no, a bunch more questions. Uh, the next one was, what other, I heard you mention University of Florida, but does Archbold collaborate with other uh, Florida universities? Yes, and I, I couldn't, I can't list them, list them all off. Um, but we have lots of different kinds of collaborations. So you have sometimes where it's a graduate student who needs to do their field work somewhere. Um, sometimes there, there's a project uh, where somebody has funding yeah, and, they need, and they need some field work like that. Sometimes it's colleges coming to stay for a week or two weeks. We recently had a school from Wales, um, not Lake Wales, Florida, but Wales in the UK <laughs> for two weeks. Uh, Harvard and Yale come down, Cornell comes down uh, just almost yearly or so for all of those three schools. Um, but we have other Florida schools too that'll, that'll vi visit us. And we do a lot of work with um, Evelyn Geyser, who's down near Miami. And I always forget which university it is. And she's been working with us for a long time on our uh, Lake Annie data. We have a really fantastic deep lake. It's, it's almost 70 feet deep. And it has um, at the bottom these undisturbed sediments that we've done cores of and gotten pollen records which means climate records and plant community records going back 30,000 years. There's a, there's a buoy out in the middle of it too that's monitoring uh, temperature and I don't know what else. And um, Evelyn Geyser and her graduate students work on that. Very cool. Uh, I used to be at UCF in the uh, aquatic biogeochemistry lab and some of uh, the people in the lab there were doing soil core work at Archbold. Mm. So seeing cool. how cool. some of the land, especially if it was uh, agricultural land, how are the nutrients, uh, especially in the water or marsh. So cool stuff. I, I think there's yeah. so many types of projects going on at Archbold. Mm. Oh yeah. Excellent. Okay, another question. Uh, for people that are just learning about Archbold now, do you have other educational videos available for people to watch? Oh yeah, uh, just Google us and our website will come up. We have a YouTube page. We have a, we have a blog that has, I don't know, 250 articles or something on it. Uh, we have a brand new website coming out. Should be next month sometime, maybe the end of the month that we've been working on really hard for a long time and it's going to be absolutely gorgeous so if you visit our current website you're gonna go oh that looks so you know 10 years ago or whatever but our new one is going to be gorgeous and then we'll have videos on there as well 
you can also visit us too. Uh, Thursday through Sundays, we're open to the public. You just walk in, it's free to visit. If you have a group, you can book a tour as well. Um, so I'll, I'll take you out for a, about an hour, 45 minutes or so and, and go exploring in the scrub together. And awesome. if, you search, if you search hard enough, there's a fun YouTube video, an educational one me and him did of me talking about animal skulls. Ah, uh, so. yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> Excellent. Awesome. So now I'm going to get a little bit more in about some of the bird stuff that you were talking about. And so first of all, I was impressed with how many species are on Department of Defense land. And mm -hmm. could you just tell people why? Why is that? Why do you think? Is it because <laughs> of a conservation management plan? Or what is the reason for that? Well, do you want me to talk about it? Yeah. yeah um, well, I worked at the Air Force range there for six years. And when you think about the idea that they're, well, first people think, oh, there's bombs, they're dropping bombs. How can there be, you know, anything there, much less endangered species? But when you're dropping a bomb, you can't be doing it right next to a bunch of houses or developments. You need a huge amount of space. So they, you know, they set aside 100,000 acres so that they have this big buffer area around where they're doing their military actions. Well, a lot of that is, I wouldn't say quite pristine, but some of the best, you know, habitat of the area that's, that's left there because they're not building anything there. And they have done a lot of activities there, a lot of logging and, and things throughout the years. But, but over time, you know, we've got a very wide variety of habitats. You know, we've got prairie and flatwoods and scrub and, um, you know, marshes, wetlands, all kinds of good things. And just, you know, at the at the base of just a lot of area and it's being left alone and it's being managed with fire um and that's the big important part too you might i think justin mentioned you might have you know some scrub habitat next to community of houses but no one's burning it because you've got houses there well the you know the air force range they maintain that habitat and burn it every you know two to five years depending on the habitat and that's what those animals require so it actually ends up being a perfect and you get something like the Florida grasshopper sparrow, and they were almost completely wiped out from the Air Force range. And the one place they held on all those years is in the high explosives area because they're wow. dropping so many bombs there and it catches on fire so often. And those birds love those really frequently burned habitats. It's perfect for them. So, wow. <laughs> there That's you go. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so is the government looking to preserve some of these lands eventually yeah. uh, like after if they're done testing it will be used for conservation that i don't know i mean i'm not sure what a long-term plan is but they are the military lands have these collaborations now with these um i don't know a lot about it myself i don't know if you know much about the, the sentinel landscapes yeah. yeah um well and to add to what emily was saying too that that range Oh, well, actually, I think you did mention it. It's over 100,000 acres. Mm. That's the, the one that's near here. Uh, that's a lot of land. <laughs> so you have a lot of land, and I don't know how much of it has buildings on it. There are some buildings there, but most of it, there's not. Um, so that's, to me, that and fire is is the reason. But yeah, but they do have management plans. They have biologists that work there. There's probably eight biologists or something that work at that one. A lot more now. More, double yeah, that. Double that. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of biologists and they take it very they really take it seriously. And they do have as part of their mission is to protect species there. Um what, what Emily was about to mention is the Sentinel Landscape project. And you can Google this, Sentinel Landscapes. It's a project that um, um ours is part of it, but there's other ones throughout the country too. So if you look up the Avon Park Air Force Range Sentinel Lands, you'll get our little page for it. And it's the federal government saying, oh, goodness, when we put it all of these ranges, they were in remote areas. There were hard, there was a couple of cattle ranchers. There was some citrus groves, but there were almost no people. That's what we like when we're flying jets around and doing all of our stuff. We And now development is creeping in everywhere in the U.S., right? Creeping in closer and closer to these places. And that's a problem for the military. So in, in order, this is this win-win situation because not that part, but the protecting the area around it. So 
um, in order to make sure that they still have that buffer, there's funds going in to help protect the rural landscape around them. And the one that is drawn around Avon Park, you can find the map online, is uh, it's huge. It's it's really big. It goes all the way down to the south end of the state. Archbold is actually in, inside of it. And um, so one of the things that we like to say Archbold is rural prosperity is good for conservation. If we can if we can keep ranchers and even citrus, which um, is not. Uh, is not like a place where lots of birds and stuff are are living but they can use it bears can move through those areas if we can keep them that instead of houses then that is good for the florida wildlife corridor but it's also good for the military too yeah i'll mention one other thing too you get something like the grasshopper sparrow and it's in the military's interest to increase numbers of some of these species because if you have one breeding pair of sparrows out there in one nest. Well, if we find that one nest, well, they've got to shut down everything, right? They can't bond there. But if if they help to increase the numbers of those birds, well, then it's okay if this one nest maybe gets lost, right? So that it's it's in their interest. So they work hard to actually have management plans in place for every one of those endangered species. And I'm the red cockaded woodpecker being downlisted, I'm sure that there's all different opinions on that from biologists, but on one hand, I, I think we should celebrate the fact that they're downlisting it because the management has been so successful. Mm. You can't take that management away. Otherwise, it's going it, it's, it's to fall apart. But um, it's, it's working. It's good to see that you put people out there. They, they learn how the land works. They listen to what the birds need. They listen to what the nature is telling them. And, uh, and it'll work. Nature will bounce back. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. So I have a question about some of the historical burns. So many people know, like you said, Florida is the lightning capital of the United States and fire occurs here and there uh, like a patchwork. But historically, how often does fire burn in a particular area at any given time, naturally, without any management. Do you know, is it like every mm -hmm. three years there'll be a fire before human intervention? Uh, there's a book by Reed Noss about the fire history of Florida. I haven't read the whole thing, but it's the, it's the go-to resource for it. Um, and he's been studying this stuff for, for decades. So I really recommend everybody get that. And I forget the statistic in it. Um, something like 95% of the habitats in Florida burn naturally. And that's kind of like, whoa, what? Even the the seasonal ponds, because so much of the marshlands in Florida um, are affected by whether it's the dry season or the wet season, they can, they can dry off, fire can go through. Even if there's water there, the grass above it will still light and the fire will carry through it um so it's all over the place it just depends on it depends on the type of, of, of place though the florida scrub is sand and it doesn't generally have grass in it so if fire needs what are the what's the fire triangle oh heat oxygen fuel heat oxygen fuel <laughs> and um with with the sandy patches fire isn't going to spread over sand it takes around nine, 10 years for you to get enough vegetation for a nice fire to spread through there. So just so historically, though, there was much more variability. And when you start reading papers about fire and the scrub, one will say between every five and 40 years, yeah. between every five and 30 years. Uh, so there was a lot of variation, but there was a lot of scrub. Mm -hmm. And when you had the, the Lake Wales Ridge is hundred about 120 miles north south, five to 10 miles wide. And there's other habitats on there too, but primarily is scrub and sand hill habitat, which has that around 10 year fire interval now. Um, lightning's hitting all over the place. Maybe one spot goes 20 years without fire and it's 40 years. There's no scrub jays left. It's okay. There's scrub jays right next to it on the other side of the of the lake or whatever. 
And so if you have enough connected land, you have all the resilience built in that you need. It's not, it's not a problem. Um, but every, but if you have a field like the dry um, prairie, grass grows fast. You could have a lightning strike every year in a spot and have another low intensity fire travel through there. And then that fire is also going to help keep the trees from coming in and you know woody material like that. And also the fact that it floods too, even though it's called dry prairie, also helps keep out the, the trees and plants. And when you're coming around the Northern Everglades now and traveling around, you'll see a lot of oak hammocks and palm trees there's many, much more of that today than there would have been 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Mm-hmm. You would have been able to stand on the ridge and look out east towards Okeechobee and see for you know 10 miles, 15 miles or whatever, and see almost no trees in that whole expanse if you were, if you were here before ditching. But starting in the late 1800s, we have just ditched everywhere in florida and drained the land as it's gotten drier the trees have come in so that's been part of the loss of of some of the um, prairie areas is because of the drainage Mm -hmm. excellent and you mentioned the lake wells ridge for anyone that's unsure of the creation of it could you give a little bit of background of how that was even formed if you don't yeah, we just did a virtual field trip on this last week. Oh, and we awesome. have a new we have a new YouTube video that's also not out yet. <laughs> but these two <laughs> these two new videos will be out sometime in the next month or so. We've got to get them done before summer camp gets started. Otherwise, they won't be out till fall. <laughs> um, so the Lake Wells Ridge is is not the only ridge. When you see those picture, the picture I had up the map um, of where the scrub jays are throughout the state. Those are all spots with piles of sand. The ridge is not, sometimes people wonder like, oh, is it like an uplift, a geologic uplift? No, it's just a dune. It's a sand pile. And where this white sugar sand comes from is erosion, weathering and erosion of the the Southern Appalachian Mountains from millions of years ago. And as they, because the Appalachians used to be looking like the Rockies and they're super super duper old so as they've turned into beautiful you know what they look like now that material got turned into uh basically glass sand silica quartz sand flow down the rivers into the ocean wave action put it into a bunch of piles so you can go to some of the coasts in florida and also have the sugar sand there too It might also be mixed in with some shells and things or coral or stuff like that. There's different kinds of sands in in the coast in Florida. But the reason that the um, the Lake Wales Ridge is the biggest and the oldest is because it's in the middle of the state. So if you imagine the ocean rising on both sides, pushing a bunch of sand into the middle of the state because you've got waves coming across and then the ocean goes down and boom, you've got we're sitting right here on about 300 feet of sand. Our actual elevation, I don't know exactly what it is, 100 feet or something, but if we started digging, we'd have 300 feet of sand right, wow. right below us. And our Very dogs cool. have dug through about 100 feet of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Excellent. So now I have another question about fire and how birds deal with it. So if there is a fire, are they flying away or have they evolved any sort of adaptations to deal with the recent burn? What is it that's attracting them or uh, what makes them different to to adapt to that land? It depends on the species. Um, you take something like the grasshopper sparrow and you know this is a very small bird and it needs to balance its time between finding food for itself and its babies and hiding from all the predators. So they like this little mosaic of places with really, really short, like short grass or almost nothing where they can go out and forage, but that's close enough to these patches of higher grass they can dip back in and and hide. So that's why they like those really frequently burned areas. And we're not talking like scorched to the ground everywhere, but those little, that little patchwork of this and that so that they can use both of those habitats. So if a burn was to come through, 
um, you, you know, what we want is those nice, slow creeping burns. They can just fly away from that for a little bit, you know, and, and once that burn is through, they can come back a couple hours later and start foraging and all over again. They don't have to go very far. You get something like the red cockaded woodpecker, they might possibly lose a nest. Um, you know, they're up in a tree. Um, and, and again, if you, if you have these frequent low intensity burns, it's usually no problem. Even though they're in a tree covered in sap, <laughs> if you've got those frequent low intensity fires going through, then the tree's fine. The tree has a really thick bark. It, the tree itself is designed to withstand fire. Um, but then if you do happen to have like a, a higher intensity, really smoky fire, it could go up that tree a little bit, uh, you know, the resin, um, it could go up into the cavity, the smoke could go up and, and suffocate the chicks. So we have occasionally, very rarely lost nests to that. But in that case, you know, if that were to happen to the birds, they'd, they'd start again, they'd start a new nest. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not a big problem. But then you've got other birds that actually benefit from the fire. You get things like the swallow-tailed kites. They see that smoke and it's a signal and they all come in because they want to eat and pick off all the little critters that are fleeing from that fire. You get big grasshoppers coming out of there. You get snakes coming out of there, rodents. So they love it. And actually there's, there's a kite, I think it's a kite species in Australia that actually spreads fires. Yes. Pick up branches that are burning, fly off with them and drop them and spread their own fire. I mean, it's insane. So that's a smart Amazing. Uh, <laughs> fire that's... really brings opportunity to many. Yes. <laughs> and that Australian bird is a good example of traditional ecological knowledge. Because if you talk to the indigenous people there, they would have been like, well, yeah, of course they do that. We've watched them do that for thousands of years. <laughs> and then it gets published in the, in, in the science. Wow, look at what we just discovered. <laughs> um, with, fire, science. with fire in Florida, I want to talk for a second about patchiness and about the history of human uh, fire, made fire in Florida. The patchiness she was talking about is so important um, and at Archbold, when we're burning the scrub, we're always making patchy burns. So you have the refugia. You've got these little spots that didn't burn. Not everything is a scrub jay. Mm -hmm. And scrub jays might really like every 10 years, but there's other stuff out there too. And when lightning makes a fire, wildfires, th they're patchy. That's, that's how they work. Maybe for whatever reason, this little spot here just didn't catch. Some people, when they're doing prescribed fires... They'll just burn out. That part's not burning. We're going to go out there. We're going to make it burn. Mm. And it's just a hundred, just aim for a hundred percent. We call it a moonscape. Um, you know, not great. We don't, <laughs> yeah, we, we really, Archbold is really against that idea. And we have, uh, after the fire, we're looking at, was it an intense fire? Which parts of it burned? We have everything all mapped. Now we're mapping them with drones, which is like mm. super cool. Mm. Um, cool. But the question of how long have been pe have people been doing prescribed fires in, in Florida is is a, an open debate currently. Researchers, the science world, was against it until the 1960s, and Archbold didn't start burning until 1977, I believe, was our first fire. And everybody knows Smokey the Bear, and the idea back in the day was like, oh my gosh, the fire is going to burn down our forest. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. Um, and it took a long time for the, the biological world to figure this out. Ecology is not that old of a science. The ecology started in the late 1800s and we're still learning, learning these things. Um, we do know that Native Americans going back many thousands of years have used fire throughout North America, but there's debate about whether they did that in Florida or not. Um, and the problem is that there's so much natural fire here that it's hard to figure out from like tree rings or lake sediments and that kind of thing. If you, you don't see a spike like, hey, 4,000 years ago in this spot, all of a sudden now there's a whole bunch of charcoal. Wow. Um, so so that's a, that's a, if you want to get in a fight with someone, you know, bring it up and, and see what they say. <laughs> but still don't set the woods on fire with your gender reveal party like they did in <laughs> California. I mean, yes. wild, wildfires can still be bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good and point. We just, well, we've got a, I think our ban is still on. We've had a burn ban because it's been so dry. Yep. 
It got lifted for like a couple days or something, but I think it's back on. Oh, okay. So that's a good point. You asked, you also have to adhere to the burn bans going on. And once you get the green light, uh, you can resume. Yeah, the, the phrase prescribed burn isn't just a euphemism. You have a prescription from the state. Mm-hmm. And they, if, the, if it's too windy, like, you know, okay, you have to burn with these parameters. If it's too windy or this or that, then you don't have the clearance to burn. Yeah. Cool. So going back to the Florida grasshopper sparrow, I know you only played a little bit of the video of the woman, but I heard that invasive fire ants could be one of the causes for their decline because they could reach the nest, the nestlings. Uh, Are you finding that to be true or what are some other reasons for their decline? Yeah, it's, it could be a multifaceted thing. Um, People did think for a little while that maybe it was just the fire ants like that seems like an easy solution like oh well they're pretty new and yeah maybe that's what it is and that that could definitely be contributing maybe when they had a bigger healthier population that wouldn't have been an issue but it could be one of those cascading events right like this happened and this happened and then the ants came in and now they're really decimating things so i don't think it's as simple as it's just the fire ants they are definitely a problem especially since the numbers of sparrows are so low so um, the biologists do go out and treat the fire ants. So if they find a nest, a, a sparrow nest, and you know they block it off so the predators can't get in it, they will go around and, and look for the fire ant nests as well. Um, luckily, they're usually pretty easy to see, mm-hmm. and they like really open areas. That's, that's where they come in. And the best way to treat them is actually with boiling water. So the yes. biologists have to come in with this these big vats of boiling water out in the prairie and just dump it in there. But they do miss them on occasion. But yeah, I was thinking, I just, I think the worst possible way to die is like being eaten alive by fire ants as you're hatching out of your egg. It's just terrible. I mean, it it does still happen. Yeah. Hmm. And so because they're basically in such a genetic bottleneck, are there worries of fitness? Uh, how are they surviving, especially if they're captive, uh, raised or bred? Uh, are there concerns about that now or in the future? Yeah, that's, that's definitely always a concern. And, you, and you'd ask, and I forgot to mention other possible reasons for declines too. Um, one of them, which could be the big one, is just loss of habitat. We don't have as many of these dry prairies left. That could have been what, you know, one of the things that started the cascade. But there are still really good patches of prairie that birds just aren't there. So we don't know why that is. But then we find them in the really crappy habitat and there they are. So it's like, (laughs) what's going on here? Um, We do believe that disease could be playing a really big part of it. And that, you know, there's been a lot of studies on that, but still not very well well understood. Um, But we do think that's an issue. And then once those things start, you know, like I said, cascading, then you start having unequal sex ratios, because that might target your females more. And then you've got all these males and not enough females. And so that's, that's all an issue. But yeah, genetic fitness is definitely something they worry about. And I mean, I'm not a captive breeder myself, so I couldn't tell you all the details, but I know the people who work on that, um, I mean, work round the clock to figure out all those issues, you know, so they try to have birds, you know, chicks that are raised by sparrows in captive breeding rather than hand raised birds like they want them learning those skills and this and that and they have pedigrees and things they're keeping track of which birds are coming from where and they're trying to mix those birds up for their captive breeding to mix up those genes and they've actually done things where you know they'll they'll have birds in the wild that they know they don't have like that lineage in captivity so they'll actually go out and collect eggs from those nests and bring them into captive breeding so that they can they can try to get that genetic diversity as much as they can. Um, they've That's actually great. S- switched eggs and nests and things like that. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a whole process. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, Very interesting. And I feel that's another thing people don't realize when you have these captive breeding programs, like how they did with the California condor or now grasshopper sparrow, a lot goes into figuring out how to diversify the gene pool, but they are limited with dwindling numbers. So I, I think it's great, uh, the efforts. And just to see how much the population has grown in a few years, that's uh, amazing. Yeah. And I would add that even though in Western science, 
when you're writing a paper, there's not supposed to be emotions in it or that type of thing. <laughs> the people who work on this care so much, care really deeply. Um, and, and when they disagree with each other too, they disagree <laughs> passionately. Uh, the folks that are putting all those hours in feeding babies who are doing all those different things that they have to do. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a labor of love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I have another question. Now, this is about the red cockaded woodpecker. And so you mentioned the trees oh, and that they have to be at least 100 years old. Or near, That's what they prefer. Near, near there, yeah. Near there. And so the question is, uh, is there even a specific height that they prefer? Oh, good question. Yes, these are good questions. Um, as I usually like to answer, that depends. <laughs> so... Where I worked at the Avon Park Air Force Range, we're more in the southern, we're along the southern edge of longleaf pine habitat. So the trees are shorter. <laughs> they just are. Um, so maybe birds would prefer to be putting their cavities 50 feet up in the air, but the trees are only 50 feet tall, so they can't. So they have to put them lower. But, um, you know, if a tree is old enough, an old tree doesn't necessarily mean a big tree. You could have really old really skinny, short, stunty trees. And as long as the diameter is just big enough, they can put that cavity in there. They, they can, put, I do think they prefer putting them a little higher up, but they always put them below those lowest branches. So you're not gonna have these lower branches and then at higher up, they always put them below those lower branches. Um, but yeah, it, it depends. I, they do tend to put them a little bit higher. Like they're not gonna be five feet off the ground, right? I mean, they're always, they always tend to be at least 12, 15 at the lower end of, of things. Now, when we're putting artificial boxes in, um, we try to get them at least 15, 20 feet off the ground higher if we can. We put them as high as we can, but also it's, <laughs> it gets tiring climbing those ladders all the time. So it's birds needs versus human needs and that kind of thing. Um, but then if you, if you work up north, I always joked that I wasn't a real, you know, RCW biologist because up north they're climbing six 10 foot ladder trees <laughs> to, you know, pull chicks out of cavities. And I've never had to do anything like that. So yeah. that like wow. North Georgia or something. Or yeah, well, that's even North Florida, North Florida Indiana, yeah. South Georgia. So yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, and so we live in the jurisdiction of the Disney Wilderness Preserve, where they also have red cockaded woodpecker uh, artificial nests that they installed. So I'd be curious to know even the, the age of the trees down by you and maybe the height difference that they, they if they prefer. Uh, that would be interesting to compare, um, yeah. but very cool. And when it comes to artificial nests, are researchers looking for a specific age as well for the tree or it can be a younger tree? Yeah, it can absolutely be a younger tree as long as it's big enough. Um, you can have a pretty young, big honking tree as long as it's at least 38 diameter at breast height, DBH, then they can put a box in there. So yeah, it's, it's pretty great. There's a lot of measuring trees that the, <laughs> that the biologists do. A lot of measuring trees. And each cluster needs, I don't know, 100, 200 acres or something, right? So you need like a big yeah. spot and then a certain number of trees that are going to work there. Right. Yeah, I've installed a lot of woodpecker boxes in my day. <laughs> okay, so... Here's another question that I was thinking. What if another bird is trying to take over that cavity? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you remove them or leave them? No, because they're all protected. Birds are protected under the Migratory Bird Act. Um, and red cockade woodpeckers are kind of wusses. They get bullied a lot by other species. Um, for example, bluebirds. Everybody loves bluebirds. They're so beautiful. They're so blue. Jerks. They're all a bunch of jerks. <laughs> And they will, they will chase the woodpeckers around and around their clusters and they will kick them right out of their boxes. Um, and some of the other woodpeckers, red bellied woodpeckers in particular, they're just a little bit bigger than the red cockaded and they like to kick them out of their, their boxes and um, not much the birds can do about it. And there's not much we can do about it. Once, once a bird is in there and it started laying eggs, another bird, we just got to leave it. But that's why it's important to have extra cavities and extra boxes in this, in these clusters, because if one of your birds gets kicked out, you don't want them to have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. 
And is it only one cavity per tree, uh, an artificial cavity per tree? Yes. Yes. I have seen some natural trees that have, it's rare, but I've seen one or two that have a couple cavities in it, <laughs> but that's pretty rare. It's usually one cavity, one bird, one tree. They don't share cavities um, except oh. when they've got their babies in there. But I was going to mention, yeah, but other birds take it over. We can't touch them, but other, other animals. Yes. Uh-huh. If there's a flying squirrel in there, we will remove it. If there's frogs and snakes in there, we will remove it. Cockroaches. Lots of cockroaches. <laughs> we will remove them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're yeah, 20 feet up in a tree or whatever with your face there pulling out cockroaches. <laughs> or snakes. Wow. Or <laughs> they must be the, the wood. Well, I, I'm taking entomology this semester. So I learned all about their gut bacteria to digest <laughs> wood. So that makes sense while, why they are there. Yeah. So, <laughs> wow. But I don't, I, I don't think most people think about that, that high up uh, a face full of roaches. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. My coworker hated cleaning the roaches. I, I was volunteered to do the really roachy trees. There's a specific smell too. You oh, can tell. <laughs> yes. Uh. <laughs> Now, are you finding that this is like kind of digressing a bit, but are any birds uh, benefiting if they're an insectivore and you have a roachy tree? Are they going to it? I don't know. I've always wondered sometimes, like if a bird is in there on a nest and a roach comes in, is he just going to eat it? I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't see why not. But I mean, some of these cavities get filled with dozens and dozens of them, right? But the the RCW cavities are actually beneficial to some other species. Um, you have birds called second. So the right cockade woodpecker is what you call a primary cavity nester. Primary meaning it is building its own cavity. There's a lot of birds that are secondary cavity nesters. So they take over other cavities, whether natural or not, you know, it could just be an old tree knot in a tree that's, you know, rotted away. That's a cavity now. So, you know, the birds might use these cavities for a while and then someone else could move in and use them. So th- those other animals, birds are benefiting. Um, you get things like uh, frogs and stuff. I've seen, <laughs> um, I can't remember the species now, the little chubby one with the spots on it. Barking tree frogs. Mm-hmm. I've seen barking tree frogs sharing cavities with RCWs and their chicks. So they wow. go up in there and they use them. Your best. I know I'm getting <laughs> there. I'm getting there. And then the biggest <laughs> one was, um, gosh, this must be Long time ago now. seven, eight years ago. Now, um, my coworker at the time, was peeping we've got little cameras peeping trees looking for things and noticed a bat in one of the natural cavities and took a picture of it and sent it to another biologist and they said that's a florida bonneted bat which is a very endangered very rare bat and we actually that's how we discovered a population of florida bonneted bats living at the bombing range um very small population we're talking on probably under 30 of them but and i actually wrote up a note about that too it was the first record of a Florida bonded bat using a natural cavity since the 70s. Wow. And actually only the second example ever, but that first one in the 70s, they only knew about it because they cut it down and oh. found the bats inside of it. But here's an endangered bird making a home for an endangered bat. Pretty cool. Mm. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. And so this is with live trees. Are there a lot of snags also mm-hmm. in the, some of the sites and you're purposely leaving them as well? Oh yeah. And the red cockade woodpeckers, they don't, they don't use the snags. Um, mm-hmm. Every once in a while, like there was an example of a, a bad fire went through and killed off a lot of, um, this was just off of our property. Actually, we weren't managing it. Bad fire went through, killed off a lot of the cavity trees. And um, in that case, they'll, they'll still use them for a while. So they're not snags exactly. They still have a lot of their bark, but they are dead trees mm-hmm. and they can't create those resin wells anymore because it's not flowing resin but they won't use those snags. Um, But a lot of other species do. So you just leave them and they stay up a long time. Lots of burns go through, but that heartwood and those pine trees is really tough. We have, we have some secondary cavity nesters. Mm -hmm. So now it just brings me back to uh, my research is with purple martins. Are you seeing purple martins at any of those areas? Because the last known natural cavity that they've seen is at the Orlando Wetlands Park. Uh, Otherwise, we're not seeing them nesting in their natural cavities anymore. 
I don't believe I've ever seen one at the Air Force range. Um, and but then again, I was usually working in the middle of the woods. <laughs> they wouldn't be there anyway. I mean, we yep. do have wetlands and things. Are, are but they in the Christmas bird counts though for Highlands County? They don't. They breed here. They don't winter here. So mm -hmm. if you see them in the winter, it's very, very, very rare. But no, I don't think they're at the bombing range. I've seen them around town in in the Martin houses, but mm -hmm. yeah, now that you mentioned, I don't, I don't even know where they roost naturally. <laughs> Yeah, I've yeah. never seen one. Exactly. And they overwinter in South America, in Brazil. Oh. But when they're breeding, like you said, uh, for the most part, we're only seeing them at the artificial mm -hmm. houses uh, people are putting up. Uh, but I had to ask. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so to, uh, two more questions, but I think very important. How is climate change affecting some of the managed lands or lands at Archbold? Are you doing any sort of mitigation? Are you noticing uh, effects of climate change? It's a really hard question. And I think you should ask it again in 10 years. <laughs> uh, when I said we had our four pillars, addressing climate change was on there. But that's very much um, doing, doing that type of research more explicitly is a new thing for us. We do have long-term data sets. Field stations are these great places for data sets, but people need to dig into them. Um, where we're located in our part of Florida is a super weird spot because it's in the middle of the state and it's on a ridge. We had a, um, we had a climate special. We don't, so we don't have any climate specialists that work there, but we do have um, not about 90 years of weather data. Uh, and we do have, carbon eddy flux towers uh, that are measuring uh, carbon and methane. So we're learning about that kind of thing. Um, and, and if you ask again in 10 years, I'm hoping we'll have some papers out there. But we did have a climate specialist come in a few years ago as a visiting scholar and she presented for the staff. And she had these amazing maps. And it seems like they had amazing um, predictive power for all of these other parts of Florida. And then the middle bit, South Central Florida was like, a. it wasn't actually a question mark, but it was basically a big question mark. But I just don't really know what's going to be in the, in this area. You know, we're, we're as far as you can be from the coast. For us though, what we worry about climate change wise is development, coastal blight, inward flight. That's That's the worry for us. And the Florida Wildlife Corridor, um, part, part of why that's so great is if we can, over the next couple of decades or so, get that protected, get all the different pieces connected in there, that gives us enough protected lands that as areas like Orlando continue to expand out, there'll still be connected lands for animals to go through. And near Orlando is, is, is a, 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 very, a, a thin green thread right there. So there's some really important spots that need to be protected. I don't know the names of all those spots, but if you look up that map, you can see the, they call them opportunity areas. Um, so yeah, we're definitely want to know these types of things. For the Florida scrub jay, if, if our region here ch shifted enough in the climate that our plant community shifted and their food sources shifted, that that would be very difficult because there's no scrub to move to further north. Mm -hmm. And I know worldwide research has seen a shift in animals either going north or going up mountains. Um, but this is a species that needs the Florida scrub habitat. Mm -hmm. So that's my roundabout answer saying we don't know. <laughs> so, yes, uh, hopefully mm, we can come up with a plan and uh, but I think what you guys are doing there is fantastic and important. And so my last question is, if any students want to get involved and they want to be an intern or a volunteer, uh, where can they find out about those opportunities? Sure, and I'll add one more climate change thing is hurricanes. For red cockaded woodpeckers, hurricanes are, cause some serious mortality. And if you start reading about it, some of the really, I think it was Hugo was like a big, huge one. I was reading one site, it knocked out, it killed over 60% of the, of the RCWs, one hurricane wow. at, at one site. Um, and if those trees yeah. are gone, that's it. You can't rebuild. 
So from that perspective with climate change, exacerbating you know, hurricane winds, all those types of things, um, that that could be a serious thing for, for the, particularly for Rikakeid woodpeckers. I don't know the other species. Uh, so now I have a quick question about okay. that. Are there any tree plantings being done? I know they will take decades to grow, but are are any uh, the longleaf pines being planted? Um, I don't know about other places. I can talk about the range though, because there's there was a long history of um, silviculture there. So a lot of the native trees were cut down and then replanted with North Florida slash pine um, for forestry purposes. But now they're slowly turning, not all of them, but some of them back into longleaf, um, especially trying to connect some of these better patches of habitat within the range. So that that is, you know, some forward thinking stuff because those trees won't be good for another 50 years, but they're they're starting to do some of that. I don't know okay. about other sites though. Wow. Well. And then if interns want to get involved, should yes. they just check out the website? Yeah, um, each each research program, it's, it's a little bit like a university. So you have um, different research programs, like she's with the Predator Prey Lab and they have two interns. Uh, that was the plant lab has interns, the, the plant ecology research program, the avian ecology research program, agroecology agro research program, herpetology, research program, restoration ecology research program, and GIS data management, all and education, all have interns. And they all put up their, um, their job postings at different times of the year. <laughs> so you just have to watch Tex Texas A&M job board. Uh, it seems like everybody posts to that one. Um, and then there, what's the other one? The Ecolog um, job board is another one that people generally post to. Um, and then our website also. Okay. Yeah. Just check Excellent. it out periodically. <laughs> Great. And if any folks want to get in touch with either you, Dustin or Emily, what's the best way they could reach you? Uh, well, I put my email, I had it up earlier so they can just pause that and, and grab it dangel at archbold-station.org. Can we put it in the, in the chat? Would that work? Um, not here because this oh. is with Zoom and it's just us, uh, but it is being broadcast through uh, YouTube, but I can add that later to the YouTube description. Okay. Yeah, we can just put them in and there. Yours and yours will probably add. end up being on the new website too, I would guess. Right. Yes, yeah. you could put it here in the chat and then I'll add it to the YouTube site. Yeah. That sounds good perfect great <laughs> yeah so now if you both will hold on a minute uh don't go anywhere but i will officially end this talk i want to thank everyone for watching and a special shout out mike by the way said archbold does fantastic work thanks for taking the time to share some of the latest news so thank you for that comment mike and uh, for all our viewers thank you for joining us this evening i hope you enjoyed our talks stay tuned for any of our future programs and be safe take care everyone Bye, thanks. <laughs> okay.